Good evening, YouTube. My name is Peter Zarconi, and tonight the subject I want to talk to you about is sin and why does God hate sin? Um, I think in order to be able to understand this question, we first have to understand a little bit about who and what God is and what is he like. People have all these images of what God is like and what he requires. And, you know, Catholics, and I'm not meaning to offend anybody with the things that I'm sharing, but it may very well offend some. But, you know, Catholics would say rosaries over and over again. What kind of God is this that would want us to repeat the same thing over and over again when Jesus specifically said, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. But when we pray, what you're doing is communicating and talking with God. He, he's not interested in, in a machine. He's not interested in, you know, some being that just wants to put on an act. Be real. He's real. And so we, we can know lots of things about what he's like. We, we know he's intelligent because I have intelligence. We know he has a personality because I have a personality. So what is that intelligence and mind and personality like? It's revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. So why does he hate sin? The, one of the most famous verses that everybody that claims to be a Christian knows is John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, so right there is his intention laid out. His intention is that he might save us. So we, we have this image that's painted by the institutional church, people preaching from the pulpit, you know, about God hating sin. And we get this idea that he has this list, you know, of what he wants us to do, what he likes, and what he doesn't like. You know, he, he likes us to do this and to stand before some altar and bow or the wailing wall as the Jews do and shake back and forth. What, what must their image be of this God? What kind of being is he that he would want us to act stupid like that? To shake back and forth. What, what is he like? Is he intelligent? Is he loving? Well, Jesus shows us what he's like. Does he have a list of stuff that he wants to, us to do and what doesn't want us to do? Yes, he has a will, but it isn't that he's this big, mean old tyrant that is stomping around heaven all pissed off all the time because we keep messing up and doing the stuff he doesn't like. You know, the, the joke about everything I like is either uh, immoral, illegal, or fattening. Well, God's on your side. The reason he doesn't want you to do some of the things that you do is not because it hurts God, but it hurts the object of his love, which is you. Sin doesn't hurt God. He is immortal, eternal. Just the fact that this almighty, all-powerful being localized himself in the form of a man just to become a man, that alone is astounding to me that he would do that. But then to suffer and be tortured by the fundamentalists of the day shows you what great love he has for us. I'm not sure I would do that for myself, but he did it for me and for you. Well, why? It says in Hebrews, it says, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, 
the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame of it, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy that was set before him? Was it this glorious, wonderful kingdom with lots of mansions in the sky? How ridiculous. He already had everything he wanted except for his bride. That's why he endured the cross. So sin doesn't hurt him anymore. It did then. Because he's perfect and we're not. Only he could cover our sins with his blood. He's perfection. And all of our righteousness, our very best, is his filthy rags. So everything that we do is a dying process because we're in a dying world. And so God hates sin not because it hurts him, but because it hurts the object of his love, which is us. Think about it. Everything you do that would be considered sinful is either self-destructive or destructive to someone else. In that is fulfilled all the law and the prophets, that we would love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So when you love God, you realize that he's on your side and he loves you and you love him. We love him because he first loved us, right? He first loved me and then I love him because he's wonderful. And so he's just totally about me. So he doesn't want me to do certain things because they're destructive to me, whether it be sex or drugs or alcohol or whatever it is that is plaguing people. It's not because he's there ready to crack down on you. He's trying to save you from destruction. And so many people quote the passage um, from Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 as though it was some threat. It's No, it's, it's an informative statement. If you work at a job and you get paid, you get paid money because you've labored at a job. Well, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. Sin works in my members, and I believe it's the cause of aging. Because man fell, and death falls upon all man because of sin because it's destructive. So everything we do that is sinful is either self-destructive or destructive to someone else. And when you realize that, you realize God is on your side. He is trying to lead you into the fullness of all that he has for you in a better life. Um, in Romans 6 and verse 21, it says, what fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So a lot of the stuff that we used to think we would like and do and whatever, we realize that was a dead end. Even sex, when I was a young man, you know, I, I couldn't quite understand why, why wouldn't God let us do some of these things that are so much fun? Well, now that I'm a little older, I realize that sex, for instance, is a source of either great joy and blessing and in, when it's fulfilled in love or a great source of destruction. And by misusing it, it destroys our whole context and understanding and ability to truly know the unity and love that is fulfilled in that one person that you are given to. So, again, God is on our side. In the message of the gospel, it says in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 19, and I would say that any message that is not of this spirit is not of God. It says in verse 
19 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, to it that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their uh, trespasses unto them, and has given unto us this ministry of reconcil reconciliation, of saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Take my burdens, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But they would lay heavy burdens on you that they are not willing to bear themselves. Understand, the God of the Bible is on your side. He loves you. He loves you and suffered and allowed himself to be tortured. That's more than I think I would do for myself. Yet he endured it. And at any moment, while they were torturing him, he could have just said, oh, okay, this is enough. Zap, you're all out of here. But he suffered and was tortured so that we might be saved. And that we are his great reward. He is, we are why he endured it. We are that joy that was set before him. And to show you that the law was our schoolmaster, the scriptures teach us that. The law wasn't meant to break you and crush you. It was meant to lift you up and to teach you so that you would know that some of those things that you're doing aren't beneficial to you. They're destructive. Coveting your neighbor's wife not only is not good for him, but it's not good for you or her. And, and so the law helps say, hey, duh, wake up. That's not good. And, and Jesus also, in the Sabbath, he tells us that in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. He gave us the Sabbath for our benefit, not to crush us in keeping this day above another. It was, and when they tried to accuse Jesus of not keeping the Sabbath, He's showing them that the law was put there for our benefit, not for our destruction. It's not because he has a bunch of rules that are just to please him, but they're for our benefit, for our sake. And therein is the love of God. So I, you know, some people will say, well, you know, it's tough love. Well, 1 Corinthians 13 doesn't, which is the definition of love, doesn't know about tough love. It says love is gentle and kind and patient and doesn't seek its own. It's not puffed up. Love endures all things. And John in his epistle says, God is love. And if any man says he loves God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For how can he love God whom he has not seen if he doesn't love his brother whom he has seen? If you, if these words are speaking to you, come unto him, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Take his yoke upon you. Accept Jesus because he's on your side. He would lift you out of this miry pit and that you would turn away from those things that are destroying you. If you are blessed by this message, share it with others. Hit the like button and subscribe. God bless you all.